in advance. And the fact that we can predict in advance when intuition might falter gives us some hope of implementing procedures to avoid those errors or imp implementing or improving some educational practices, at least to make people aware of the risks of error that they are running when they run them. There are, of course, other psychological factors that affect our judgments. For instance, there's the dread factor. If risks are unfamiliar and potentially catastrophic, people tend to judge them as greater than risks that are familiar and or have delayed consequences. You may be terrified by the possibility of a nuclear accident and yet never think twice about jaywalking. Although the odds of a nuclear accident are only a tiny fraction of the odds of getting hurt while jaywalking. And what if we make our judgments and decisions in a group? Will that help ensure the rationality of our choices? What if we assemble a group of the brightest people around? What then? That this government will not hesitate... In 1960, President John F. Kennedy gave the go-ahead to the disastrous Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba. Fidel Castro and his government resoundingly defeated the U.S.-backed invasion. It was a terrible embarrassment for the new Kennedy administration. Psychologist Irving Janus studied the records of the cabinet meetings in which the decision to invade Cuba was made and found examples of the distorted reasoning he calls group think. In this particular decision, the dominant decision rule seemed to be preserve the harmony of the group. Don't make waves. Don't raise any critical questions. Don't express your doubts. And that gets me to one of the main symptoms of groupthink, which is self-censorship of doubts. And another such symptom is a sense of unanimity of the group that's based on the false assumption that silence means consent. So if nobody's raised any objections, the assumption is that everybody's going right along with it. There are a number of other uh, important symptoms like uh, the illusion of invulnerability as I call it which refers to the tendency of the members of the group to feel well it may be a difficult problem that we've got on our hands here but uh, we're powerful enough and clever enough so that uh, where others may fail we'll certainly succeed. There's finally one other very important symptom that I call mind guarding and that involves various members of the group taking on the role of guarding the president and other members of the group from any of the information that might get them to change their mind or at least raise questions about what they're planning to do. Groupthink is not inevitable, however. It can be avoided. Irving Janus has outlined a number of procedures that decision makers can implement to promote more rational judgments. One of the uh, suggested ways of preventing groupthink involves having a devil's advocate appointed by the leader. Uh, another idea that emerges very clearly from the uh, situation of uh, isolation of the group is to have the leader deliberately bring in members of the government or others in the organization who have uh, some information to convey to be present at various meetings and to encourage them to raise whatever objections or ideas occur to them. We can't avoid making decisions, but we can try to avoid some of the pitfalls of bad decision making. One of the newer fields of psychology is the psychology of negotiation, which attempts to avoid the sometimes fatal cost of bad decisions. People negotiate over almost everything, from the price of new cars and the level of salaries to the lives of hostages and the fate of nations. Recently, psychologists have begun to study why many negotiations fail and how the process can be improved for the benefit of both sides. Max Bazerman of Northwestern University has identified the five most common cognitive mistakes that negotiators make. The five major mistakes that most negotiators make are one, that they fail to consider the judgments of the other side in negotiation. Two, they tend to non-rationally escalate commitment to a previous course of action and escalate conflict. Three, they tend to have a very limited frame in their perspective to conflict. Four, they tend to be overconfident that they will prevail in disputing situations. And 
five, they tend to view negotiations very much in a zero-sum manner. What you win, I lose, and vice versa, even when that's not objectively true. Business and government professionals come to workshops run by Basiman and his colleague Lawrence Suskind to learn how to improve their negotiating skills. Well, Robin, your attorney called me and said that you wanted to meet with me and see if we can discuss these problems and get them ironed out. Basiman assigns exercises like this one. One participant plays the owner of a small business, the other her irate customer. The task, negotiate a disputed bill. The bill I have before me is this ridiculous bill of $774. Well, that, I, I, did, I went now, back. what's that and, bill? Well, I went back and added the true cost of it after you stormed out, you insulted me in front of a customer, potential customer, in, in front of some of my employees, and I just will not tolerate that kind of behavior from you. Wait, and who insulted that, whom? You're the, one. the two negotiators that were watching fell victim to a variety of the biases that we talked about earlier. Neither considers a perspective from the other side, and neither tries to identify what the whole problem looks like as a whole. You're willing to say then that that bill that you gave me, the way it's here, seven hundred and seventy-four dollars, is completely erroneous and fictitious, no, and throw it out? Most definitely not. What we need to do in any negotiation is to think about what's acceptable to the other side, as well as what we hope to get out of the negotiation. By thinking about the other side. We can learn a whole lot that will improve our effectiveness in a negotiation situation. There's no way that he's going to look at your bill and say that it has any credibility. Well, I'll see you in court. The psychological story of decision making doesn't end, however, when a decision has been made. The act of making a decision can trigger a flood of other processes. According to psychologist Leon Festinger, whenever we choose to do something that conflicts with our prior beliefs, feelings or values, a state of cognitive dissonance is created in us. A tension between what we think and what we do. When this tension makes us uncomfortable enough, we're motivated to reduce it in a number of ways. We may change the way we think about the decision, or try to change how others think about it so that they can support our decision. Or we may change some aspect of our behavior so that our decision seems more in character with us. In other words, we try to reduce the dissonance between how we think we should act and how we actually act by changing one or the other. In the mid-50s, Leon Festinger and his colleague Merrill Carl Smith conducted a classic experiment in which students were engaged in very boring tasks. The students were then given a request by one of Festinger's staff. Okay, that's fine. Uh, let me tell you now what we're actually studying here. It's the effect of preparatory mental set on performance. The rest of the subjects are prepared by being told that the experiment will be very interesting and enjoyable. In fact, lots of fun. Uh, now I have a somewhat unusual request to make of you. Uh, the next subject is waiting right outside, but the fellow who ordinarily gives the spiel uh, isn't here. Uh, I wonder if you could possibly take his place. As a matter of fact, we figure we'll be needing someone in the future so I'd like to offer you a $20 retainer and have you remain on call for us. Uh, would that be all right? $20? That'd be fine. Half the students were randomly assigned to the group that received $20 for lying that the experiment was fun. The other half were given only $1 for lying. Dollar as a sort of a retainer and have you remain on call with us. Uh, would that be all right with you? Yes, that'll be all right. The cognitive dissonance came from the knowledge that the experiment was in fact boring and one dollar was insufficient reward for lying. Many of the one dollar subjects actually convinced themselves that the experiment was fun after they made their decision to reduce the dissonance between their prior beliefs and their behavior. They came to believe a big lie for a small incentive. I was talking to a girlfriend of mine who participated in an experiment last week and she said it was very tedious. Oh, I don't think that was the same experiment because this one wasn't boring at all. I didn't think so. The $20 subjects, on the other hand, felt no dissonance because they felt comfortable in lying just for the money. He said it was pretty miserable and that I should do everything I could to uh, get out of it. Well, I think maybe your friend was wrong. Perhaps it was a different experiment because this was a lot of fun. It, it appeared to me as if a... For, as if it were a puzzle. We you know, had to turn these knobs, and I tried to figure out what we were doing it for, but I really couldn't figure it out. Perhaps she'll have better luck. 
Other theories might predict that the man who is paid most would have the highest motivation for enthusing over the dull task and would be most sold on it himself. Cognitive dissonance theory leads to an exactly opposite prediction. The man who is paid $20 knows that the task is dull, but he also knows that he had sufficient justification for saying that it wasn't. Did you enjoy working on the manual task? Well, it uh, really wasn't too enjoyable. In fact, it was rather boring. How about the man who is paid $1? He knows the task is dull, but he has two discrepant thoughts. He also knows that he did not have sufficient justification for saying that it wasn't. For him, there is dissonance. Time after time, we have seen what follows. He reduces the dissonance by changing his opinion about the dullness of the task. Did you enjoy working on the manual task? Yes, I enjoyed it. Would you like to participate in such an experiment again? Yes, I think I would like to. Any time there is insufficient reward, there will be dissonance. The general principle seems to be that people come to believe in and to love the things they have to suffer for. By discovering how people actually behave, and not how some theory says they ought to behave, psychology can provide guidelines to help us catch ourselves before we go astray, or redirect us once we do, if we follow them. In this program, we began in the cool cognitive climate of judgment. As we moved to decision-making with its motivational dynamics, the climate warmed up considerably. In our next program, we're going to head for some hotter venues, where motivation and emotion thrive. How we're driven by appetite and passion, blocked by fear and guilt, made joyful and sad. Next time, I'm Philip Zimbardo. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.